Good morning. morning. And welcome. Welcome to worship this morning here at St. John Lutheran Church. Special welcome to all of those of you joining us online from home. It's a pleasure to have you with us here today. And a very special welcome to all of you who have served in our nation's armed forces. Veterans Day is coming up this week. And we'd like to recognize those who have served in our nation's armed forces. If you would, please, if you could stand up now so that we could recognize you with a round of applause. And let's go. Thank you. Thank you very much. And speaking of Veterans Day, uh, we have... Uh, We are partners with a school that meets in one of our uh, buildings across the way there. And at 8.15 on Tuesday morning, they will hold a Veterans Day service here in the sanctuary with a singing of patriotic hymns and a singing of each uh, each service song. So I invite you to come and be a part of that. In your bulletin today, you'll find uh, find this white connect card. It's an opportunity for you to connect with us and us to connect with you. There's contact information on the front and next steps of faith on the back. Please do uh, take that out and hold on to it because I'll be talking about this later on in my service. And in the pews in front of you, you'll find these yellow prayer cards. If you have someone you'd like us to, to pray for as part of our service today, please go ahead and fill that out now so we can pray for your loved one. And the ushers will bring it up to, uh, to me during this singing of the first hymn. A couple of quick announcements before we start our worship service. And the first is a congregational meeting today, and that is directly after this service, after the late service. It should be short, sweet, and to the point. There's only one item, and that has to do with our denomination's constitution. So please do stay and become a part of that uh, that meeting. Also coming up is 24 hours of prayer. Now you'll find more information in your bulletin in the back. You'll find more information online, and I'll be talking about that also as part of my sermon. But let me just put it out uh, out to you right now that Next week, uh, next weekend, Saturday to Sunday, I'm calling the church to 24 hours of prayer, so keep that in mind. Uh, the next one here, too, is Operation Christmas Child, and so you, no doubt you saw out in the lobby there, we have a table set up for Operation Christmas Child, and there's plenty of ways that you can get involved, whether that's by donating funds or by, uh, by volunteering your time and your labor to help uh, pack the boxes and pack the truck. And we're also, we're, we set a goal this year of 350, of 350 shoe boxes, which is up from last year's goal of 300 because we met that one. So let's raise the bar, right? Yeah. So we're really looking forward to that. And if you have any questions, and one of the gospel opportunities, that's right. And if you have any questions, they can come and speak with you, right? Because you'll be out in the lobby afterwards. Excellent. Thank you, Gloria. And then our final announcement here is about our turkey project. This is one of my favorites every year. You know, every year the Christian men of Bernie, we get together out at the fairgrounds and we cook turkeys for families in need right here in Bernie. And there's an opportunity to either use a fryer or my favorite to cook them in a trash can, which sounds terrible, but is really, really good. Uh, And if you'd like to be a part of that, if you'd like to either donate money or sign up and be a part of that, there's a sign up table out there in the lobby and Frank Bush is staffing it so he can answer all your questions. So there's other things going on in our church and encourage you to check those out at your convenience. But we've come to worship the Lord, so let us pray. Lord God Almighty, we thank you and we praise you for this beautiful, beautiful day here in South Texas. And God, we thank you for the freedom, for the liberty to gather together as your people and to worship you. Lord, on this Veterans Day, we thank you for the brave men and women who have made that freedom possible. And we ask, Lord Jesus, come. Speak your word to us. Let us hear what you are saying. Stir in our minds, stir in our hearts, stir in our wills, that we might respond to you with obedience and with faith and with trust. For we ask this, Jesus, in your holy name. Amen. Amen. And our service this morning begins with our brief order of confession and forgiveness, which is found on the screen above us. If you would please stand as you are willing and able. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, 
that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us now confess our sins before God. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us share God's peace this tonight. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
us pray. Merciful Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please remain standing. Our lesson this morning is the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke in the 6th chapter. Now in these days, Jesus went out to a mountain to pray, and he continued all night in prayer to God. And when morning came, Jesus called his disciples together, and from them he chose twelve whom he named apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter and Andrew his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, uh, Matthew and Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who is called the Zealot, Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. I preach this morning in the name of God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So this is the month of November, and as often happens this time of year in the church, so now, once again this year, we are starting a short sermon series on stewardship that is on giving to the Lord through the church. And this year, I have built our stewardship sermon series around a prayer that is very familiar to us, because it's a prayer that we pray week after week after week here in the, in the traditional services. It's our offertory prayer. You just heard it, and it goes like this. Merciful Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And over the course of the next three weeks, we will be looking at these three portions in order, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, and we start this week with the first portion, ourselves. Merciful Father, we offer with joy in thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves. The first thing we give to God is not our possessions. The first thing we give to God is not our money. The first thing we give to God is ourselves. And that's the point of our very short lesson for today in which Jesus spends all night in prayer. Now our lesson today comes from very early in the gospel story. It's Luke chapter 6. And to put that into context, in Luke chapter 2, Jesus is born. In Luke chapter 3, Jesus is baptized by John in the Jordan. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus is tempted by the devil in the wilderness. In Luke chapter 5, Jesus begins his ministry of preaching, of teaching, of healing, of casting out demons. People come out to hear him, crowds come out to hear him and to see him first by the hundreds and pretty soon after that by the thousands. Jesus' ministry is up, it's running, it's off to a really good start. And then we come to Luke chapter 6, to our lesson today, where Jesus faces the very first turning point in his ministry. And Jesus has his very first big decision to make, namely how to capture this early momentum and turn it into a lasting movement. And that's not something that Jesus can do on his own. No, Jesus needs other people to do it with him. Jesus needs other people to do it for him. Jesus needs other people to, to come alongside of him, to help him multiply the impact of his ministry beyond his own person and carry the good news of God's kingdom to far more people than Jesus could simply reach only by himself. In short, Jesus needs some of these disciples to step up to the plate and become apostles. Some of these followers to, becomes one, to become ones who go out into the world in Jesus' name. And they don't know it yet. But those who are chosen for that task, those who are chosen to be apostles, they will go on to become the foundation of the church. The cornerstone is, of course, Jesus Christ himself. But after Jesus is gone, after Jesus ascends back into heaven, Jesus trusts his mission, his ministry, his work to these 12 apostles. And they not only carry it out, but they do greater work than Jesus 
Because they take the good news of God's kingdom and they, they extend it far beyond the borders of the promised land and out into the greater, wider Roman world. So this is a big decision. A big, history-making, world-changing, epoch-making decision that Jesus has to make who these 12 apostles will be. And Jesus does not take that decision lightly or make that decision on his own. Jesus turns to his Father in prayer. And Jesus spends all night in prayer to his Father, asking for his Father's guidance. In these days, Jesus went out to the mountain to pray, and all night, all night, Jesus continued in prayer to God. Jesus continued all night in prayer to God, and in those nighttime hours, Jesus brought himself. Jesus brought his mission. Jesus brought his ministry. Jesus brought his disciples. Jesus brought this decision about who from the disciples should be his apostles. Jesus brought all of this to his Father in prayer asking his father for help, asking his father for wisdom, asking his father for guidance. And his father answered that prayer and gave it to him, leading his son to select the 12 men who should be his apostles. And when that night was over, when the sun came up on the next morning, Jesus acted on his father's guidance right away. He gathered his disciples together. And from his disciples, he selected and chose 12 men named them his apostles and gave them his power, his authority, special privileges and responsibilities to go out into the world in Jesus' name. And as if that weren't enough for one day's work, then Jesus sat down and gave the longest and most sustained teaching of his entire ministry, the most famous sermon that has ever been preached, and that's the Sermon on the Mount. What a day that was. It was a turning point in Jesus' ministry. A major first step forward in, the, in building a worldwide church of Jesus Christ. It was a multiplication of Jesus' ministry, both in numbers and in depth, in selecting the 12 apostles and in teaching the Sermon on the Mount. And it all took place after Jesus continued all night in prayer to his Father. And my friends, we are facing turning points too. In our church, in our town, in our lives, in our nation, we're facing a turning point in our church. Our church, just a few weeks ago, turned 91 years old. Most churches don't make it that long. And many of the churches that do make it long are kind of winding things down right about now. We're not winding them down, we're ramping them up. My predecessor, Pastor Henry Schulte, did a tremendous job building this church up, giving it a new, a new story, a new chapter of life and of health and of growth, and we are building on that foundation that he has laid. Last year, we broke through a major barrier in our church growth. It's called the 400 barrier. It's like a ceiling that most churches really struggle to get through, and last year, we busted through it. Last year, our average weekly attendance was 419 people per week. Last month, we took a major step forward on a building project that you'll see taking place in the weeks and months ahead on the other side of our campus over there. We've now got a picture of a disciple that defines who we are and what we do. St. John Lutheran may be 91 years old, but this is a healthy, vibrant congregation with momentum behind it and a vision for the future that we're going for. We're at a turning point in our church. We're at a turning point in our town. I don't know if you've noticed this, but a lot of people are moving into Bernie. Huh? <laughs> moving into Bernie by the bucketful. And with good reason, because it is a great, great place to live. Year after year after year, Bernie makes the list of best small towns in America. Did you know that Kendall County is the third fastest growing county in Texas? And it is the fifth fastest growing county in America. For these next 10, 15, 20 years, there is this window of opportunity for us. When our community is growing, our town is growing, our county is growing, and it should only be natural for our church to grow too, but that window won't stay open forever. We've got to seize that opportunity before that window closes. We're at a turning point in our town, a turning point in our church, a turning point in our lives, right? Just take a look. I mean, nobody saw the coronavirus coming. 
Nobody knows when the coronavirus is going to leave, but we all know the coronavirus sure has changed things now from what they used to be. It will change things for weeks and months to come, and when the coronavirus finally does exit stage right, Lord only knows what kind of permanent changes to our life and society it will leave in its place. I, for one, hope that we can at least get back to shaking hands once again. We're at a turning point in our lives because of the coronavirus, and we are at a turning point in our land, in our nation. We have just gone through the most hotly and bitterly contested election in generations. And in hindsight, the 2020 election turned out to be, well, you know, pretty much what we could have expected from anything in 2020, which was unlike anything else we'd ever seen. Right? It's still not settled, won't be settled for weeks, but even once it is settled, we will be fools to think that things will simply settle down and get back to what they were again. Mm -mm. Our nation is changing, our culture is changing, our society is changing, our government is changing. And who knows what that means for people of faith in the years to come, but it'll be different from what we've known in the past. We're at a turning point in our nation, in our lives, in our town, in our church, we are at a turning point. And now to a certain extent, I, I feel like we're ready I feel like we're ready and prepared for that turning point largely because we know who we are and what we are about and we know the work that God has given us to do. God has given his church on earth a mission and that is to go and make disciples. And we know who we are and what we're supposed to do, that we are here to make disciples who love the Lord their God by worshiping him weekly and walking daily with him. We are here to make disciples who love their neighbors by connecting consistently and serving monthly in our church and in our community. We have a clear picture of who we are as God's people. We have a clear picture of the work that we are about. We have a vision of where we want to be three, four, five years from now. We have a strategic plan to get us from here to there. We are putting staff and structure into place. I feel like to a, a certain extent that we are ready that we are ready to meet these challenges ahead of us, these turning points in our church, in our town, in our lives, and in our nation, to a certain extent. But to a greater extent, I know that we are not ready. I know that we need something more. You know, when I came to this church back in 2016, I read a book called Autopsy of a Deceased Church, not because I thought St. John was dead or dying, all right? but because I wanted to make sure that St. John would thrive and live and grow on my watch. And so I read this, this study of churches that didn't make it, of churches that shut their doors and closed down, an average of 3,000 churches a year in America. And just a couple days ago, late last week, I heard from our denomination, the North American Lutheran Church. Our denomination is estimating that across North America, 18,000 churches will not reopen but will be permanently shut down because of the coronavirus. 18,000. Now again, this church is not one of them. Right, this church is healthy, this church is growing, we are in a growing town, we are blessed with financial resources. This church is not one of them, but I want to do everything possible on my watch to make sure that this church will never be one of them. And so I read and I studied this book to learn by example, well, what about the churches that didn't make it? How can I learn from their mistakes? And a lot of the changes that you've seen these last few years are as a result of what I learned. So, for example, the start of a, a praise service or the reveal survey or doing the story. Uh, we've hired a communications director. We've called someone here to be a pastor. We've got the connect cards now. We've got online giving, a focus on discipleship, an emphasis on hospitality, and so on and so forth. These are all things that we can do, best practices of what it means to be a church so that this church never becomes a statistic in a book like that. There are things that we can do and things that we are doing but we can only do so much as a church, as an institution, as an organization. We can only do so much and God can do so much more in us and through us and for us. 
And that was the story of the follow-up to this book, which was called Anatomy of a Revived Church. And that's about the churches that did make it. The churches that were plateaued or declining, and then by God's grace and with hard work, they turned it around into a new chapter of life, of health, of growth. And what the researcher found is that what all of those churches had in common, each and every church to a single one without exception, what all of those churches had in common was an intentional focus on prayer. So let me read something for you. This is what the author wrote. He said, I have yet to find a sustained church revitalization that was not undergirded by a powerful movement of prayer. Prayer is imperative, prayer is a priority. Specifically, there was one church that set aside 24 hours of uninterrupted prayer with at least two people praying at all times, each participant committed to praying for one hour at the church for the church. And when I read that book, when I read those words back in shutdown in May and June, I got so excited, I literally got up out of my chair and started walking around because I felt something stirring deep inside of me. I felt a fire in my bones, a light bulb went on in my head. And I made a promise to God back then during shutdown that when this thing lifted up, we were going to do that too. That we were going to host 24 hours of prayer here at our church. And so that is what we're going to do. And today I am calling you to prayer. Today I am calling our church to prayer. For one whole day, 24 hours, with at least two people praying at the church, for the church, for one hour each, 24 hours around the clock of uninterrupted, persistent, insistent prayer. I'm calling us to prayer. And it begins next week, next Saturday at 12 noon, right here in the sanctuary. That's where we'll kick it off. And it will continue right here in the sanctuary through the afternoon, through the evening, through the, through the nighttime hours with our emergency response team providing security for us during those nighttime hours. And then at 7 o'clock on Sunday morning, we'll move from here in the sanctuary across the street to the chapel where it will continue until noon on Sunday so that we can gather as a church and worship here in the sanctuary while across the street in the chapel, other members of the church are praying for us in worship. 24 hours of uninterrupted, persistent, consistent prayer at the church, for the church. Two people each hour for 24 hours around the clock. And I'm asking you to commit and sign up for one of those hours. Now, you're welcome to sign up for more than one. And you're welcome to come even if you don't sign up. But the vision, the vision is that for 24 hours we will have at least two people praying each and every single hour of that day. To make that happen, I need you to commit. I need you to sign up to one hour of prayer. And I know that for many of us, one hour seems like an awful long time to pray. And so we've written a prayer guide that we'll have available uh, that weekend, next weekend. We've written a prayer guide that will help you and lead you through that 60 minutes of prayer. It's a very simple prayer guide. Oh, and by the way, for those of you who are joining us online, this prayer guide is available online so that if you're not yet comfortable coming to church and worshiping with us, you can print this out and still participate from home. We'll have these available for you. It's a very simple guide. It'll walk you through that 60 hours. It begins with an opening liturgy to help you get settled in and then centered, focused on what it is that you've committed to do. And the heart of it is we lead you through prayers, specific prayers, specific things to pray for, for our church, for our community, for our nation, for our denomination, for those who are in affliction, for your family and friends and loved ones. Do you have somebody that you are praying for in your family? Here is an opportunity to come in an hour of prayer for them. And of course, for yourself. Like Jesus, are you facing a turning point in your life? Like Jesus, are you facing a major decision in your life? Well, here is an opportunity to bring that decision to the Lord in prayer. 
And then it ends with a closing liturgy to wrap things up and give God thanks for what he's done. And my friend, you will have something to give thanks for. This will be a rich, rich time of closeness with the Lord. Give yourself to God, give an hour to God, and he will give himself to you. That is his promise. He says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. He says, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened for you. Do you have something that you're asking for from God? Do you have someone who you're seeking for, for God? Do you have something that you're knocking on the door that you want God to do? Here is an hour where you can ask and seek and knock and hold on to God's promise that you will find just as he has promised. My hope and prayer is that if you participate and commit an hour to the Lord, that that hour will be a turning point in your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I am confident that these 24 hours of prayer will be a turning point in the story of our church. I want you to be a part of that story. I want you to be a contributor to that story. I want you to commit. And here's what you need to do. You can sign up online or using the Connect card. If you got your Connect card, why don't you take it out now? You can see in the back there are 24 boxes. 24 boxes on the back, one for each hour. Simply go ahead and check off the box that you'd like to commit to. Put your name on the front so we know who you are. And then simply drop it in the offering basket on the way out the door today. If on the other hand, if you'd like to take home and think about this, or maybe you have to coordinate your, your family schedule, we also have an opportunity for you to sign up online. Simply go to our website here, Click on the button, you can scroll down and select the hour that you would like to pray. I will be here to kick us off at Saturday at 12 noon, and then I've signed up and committed to pray at 4 and 5 in the morning on Sunday morning. Join us. Join us. If you've never before in your life spent an hour to prayer, try it. Take that step of faith and try it. Give yourself, give your time to the Lord, and he will give himself to you. You will be blessed. And after all, that's what giving is about. That's what this month of stewardship is about. It's about giving to the Lord. And the first thing we give to the Lord is not our money. The first thing we give to the Lord is ourselves. And this year, our church. So give your time, give yourself to the Lord, bring our church to the Lord in prayer. That's what I'm asking you to do. You know, when Jesus was faced with a turning point in his life, when Jesus was faced with a major decision that he had to make, he didn't take it lightly and he didn't try to do it on his own. No, he took it to the Lord in prayer and he continued all night in prayer to his God and Father. And that's what we are going to do too. Join us and let's see what God will do in your lives and in our church. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, we thank you and we praise you for this day which you have given to us. God, thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for sending your Son not only to be the sacrifice for our sin, but a model a model of the godly life, of how we are to live. And Jesus, we thank you that you have modeled for us taking our decisions to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, I pray that if there is anyone who is struggling with a turning point in their life, anyone who is struggling with a decision, Jesus, I pray that they would hear your word and your invitation to take it to you. And God, I pray. Lord, I pray that you would stir in the hearts and the minds and the wills of our people, that you would raise up people who will pray at our church, for our church, around the clock. And Lord, might that event be a time, the start of a new chapter in our lives. For we pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. 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 And at this time, our service continues with our song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus.
now for the confession of our Christian faith. We confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, and the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Holy God, we give thanks that you are a God who listens to our quiet concerns, to the sighs of our hearts, to the pleading of our voice. Help us always to come to you openly in prayer. Dear God, we ask that you would use our prayer life to not only be a place where we can lift our concerns, but that it would be a place where we would listen to your Spirit's guidance. Mold us into your image, Lord. Gather our families to seek your glory. Make us into people who seek you with our whole lives. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Almighty Lord, as our church seeks to honor you with its ministry, we ask that your Spirit would work mightily in the upcoming prayer vigil that you would use this to strengthen our faith, clarify purpose, bless the church and community, and work in our lives. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Almighty God, many in our nation remain anxious for our country. Help us to continue to give our fears to you. Lord, we ask that you would unify our nation and remind us that you are in control. Lord, we ask that your will would be done in the wrapping up of this election and that you would be building up all those who have been elected at the local, state, and federal level. Build them up with your Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we remember this upcoming Veterans Day and we thank you for sustaining this nation in times of trouble, preserving our liberties. Lord, we thank you for those brave men and women who have fought to preserve our freedoms and safety with honor, courage, and sacrifice. May those who have passed be commended to your care and our remembrance. May their families be comforted by your spirit, and may all living veterans be supported and strengthened to your service. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we ask that you would comfort and protect our military members and be with their loved ones who wait at home. We especially lift up to your care our former military members and all members currently serving in the military. Josh Bitsky, Luke Jordan, Jarrett Janik, Damian Pipkin, Rusty Nail, Forrest Voss, Morgan Voss, Michelle Jordan, Arthur Waltrup, and Aiden Shield. Encourage and keep them safe in your care. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, we continue to remember those in isolation and difficult circumstances due to the COVID virus. As people make difficult decisions about travel and work and education, Lord, we ask that you would give your holy wisdom to our leaders, to our doctors, to those researching this virus. We ask that you would comfort those who are lonely or anxious and that where people feel separated, that you would gather them together in your love. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, we also lift up the burdens of the church and especially those who have asked for prayers on their behalf. We ask for your blessing for Chris Scherf, Fuchsia Reed, Don Bolin, Bill and William, and Lord, we commend all who have passed to your care, and we ask that you would bless and comfort their grieving families. Bless the families especially of Mark and Tom and John. 
And Lord, we ask that you would remember and keep close those who are ill in our congregation, especially Vernell Johnson, Hudson Uland, Karen Schneider, Jeremiah Michael Welch, Jim Shields, Ed Wandry, the father of Joey Gabra, Aaron Helm, and Debbie Lane, and be with those with long-term illnesses, Shirley Steidel, Sky Baldwin, Melva Williamson, Chell Oliverson, Betty Steubing, Sue Bartman, and Grant Meadows. And Lord, we give thanks for the healthy birth of Annabelle Lee Justice, daughter of Sarah and Kevin. We ask that you would keep these families strong in faith. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. And please be seated now for special music and we'll have the deep, deep love of Jesus. the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And our closing hymn is, Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Four verses. <laughs> Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.